Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the final Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture for 2024 with the title Unveiling Hidden Treasures, Exploring New Geological Insights from the Delamarian Margin. Just some context, the speakers for the Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture series are nominated by Geoscience Australia staff in recognition of their major achievements and contributions to earth science. And as I said, this is the final one of this in this series for 2024. I'm Jeff Fraser uh, from the Mineral Systems Branch here at Geoscience Australia, and I'll be chairing your seminar today. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. And for those of us here in Canberra, we particularly pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. So today we'll be hearing from Chris Lewis. Um, Chris is a graduate from the University of Adelaide and has a background in geochronology and isotopic geochemistry. His role now is Director of the Regional Geology and Drilling Team here at GA. And in that role, Chris provides strategic leadership to deliver large-scale regional projects, collaborating with government, industry and academic stakeholders. And as we'll hear today, as part of the successful and recently completed Exploring for the Future program, Chris and his team have worked on a major project revealing exciting potential for new mineral resources, including critical minerals in the underexplored Delamarian margin. Chris will present on how this work has led to an improved understanding of Delamarian origin itself, following a concerted campaign of sampling, including drilling, and then analyses of these samples for geochemistry, geochronology, geophysical surveys, and provide a, an, over, an overview of how these insights have provided better understanding of how the Delamarian margin evolved and the mineral potential in that region. So please join me in welcoming Chris to the podium to hear more about this work. Thank you for that warm welcome, Jeff. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you today as part of the Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series. The title of this talk, Unveiling Hidden Treasures, was chosen as I felt it conveyed the value of pre-competitive geoscience data and interpretations Geoscience Australia and our collaborators deliver to all Australians. That is, and it's a little bit naff, but it's this new knowledge from the program of work or programs of work like EFTF that is the treasure. As part of the now completed Exploring for the Future program, we sought to shine a light on the darkness that was the relatively poorly understood and less explored Delamarian origin, and specifically the Loch Louis Cars Belt. I'd like to acknowledge that the content in this talk is not my own. Rather, it's from the efforts of many across Geoscience Australia and our collaborators and partners. This is a model of the Earth, as it may have looked over 500 million years ago, in a period called the Cambrian. In this and later Earth models, dark blue represents the deep ocean, light blue shallow seas, and land is represented by greens and browns. Although the landforms bear no, no real resemblance to the continents of today, we have, they have uh, on this map superimposed the outline of the Australian continent. We also see Antarctica in the central south and even the, uh, the Indian subcontinent. However, unlike today, where we have a diversity of life on land and in the seas, the Earth 500 million years ago had little to no life on land. This is an artist's conceptual model of Mars. On the left hand side is Mars today, dry, barren. And on the right, it's the, the wet Mars environment where researchers and scientists believe that Mars once held oceans. The reason I show a picture of Mars is because the image on the right may be a reasonable representation of what the Earth looked like 500 million years ago. 
There are no animals, at least on land, no trees, no grasses. At most, life above the waves may have consisted of microbial mats called stromatolites and algae and fungi existing in symbiosis as lichens. During the Cambrian period, the global average temperature of Earth, of Earth was higher than it is today. The world was much warmer and was tropical to semi-tropical. It was in these shallow tropical seas that most of life existed. Even here in Australia, we have the evidence of, of creatures like Anomalocaris, the, the meter-long super predator shown on the left, but also arthropods and trilobites like Emucaris and Kangakaris. These are Australian natives, if you like, and are found in the Emu Bay Shale of Kangaroo Island. Throughout this talk, I'll be providing a point of reference on these maps, on these globes. It's quite small, but here we have a little red dot on what is now Broken Hill. This will be our point of reference, as Broken Hill is the major town closest to the area of interest which I'll be speaking to today. Now, something for a little bit different. I challenge you to keep an eye out in these slides for four hidden items. Farmers Union iced coffee, a stereo net, a phone, and a pirate quote. The reason I provide this, some slides may be a little bit geological or technically heavy, and if you find your mind wandering off onto other things, <laughs> use this as a way to bring yourself back. Geological time is long, and unless you are working frequently with it, we often have difficulty comprehending the length of time as it's displayed on the chronostratigraphic time scale shown here on the right. I'm sure many of you have heard that the Cretaceous theropod, the Tyrannosaurus rex, is closer in geological time to an iPhone than it is to the Jurassic Age Stegosaurus. By comparison, in this talk, we'll be looking over 450 million years of Earth history from around 850 million years ago to 400 million years ago, but we're focusing mainly within the Cambrian period. The time passed between Stegosaurus and today is only a third of this 450 million year old uh, time period. But why does this matter? The Earth is dynamic, constantly moving and constantly changing. A concept I would like to convey early is the one about how far field events can have an impact on more proximal or close by geology. Think of it like a slinky. If you push or pull on a slinky at one end, it will generate compressional and extensional waves. The impacts of these waves are captured and recorded in the geology. For the last 500 million years, the compression and extension events that gave rise to the Delamarian origin have continued their eastward retreat. Even today's Tonga Kermadak subduction zone which represents the boundary between Australia and the Pacific Plates, started its existence in the Cambrian. Through cycles lasting hundreds of millions of years, Australia saw the initiation, cessation and reinitiation of successive convergent, margin, uh, convergent margins that progressively built the continent we know today. This talk will touch on how younger tectonic events influenced the formation of mineral systems within the Cambrian aged, mostly, Cambrian aged Delamarian origin. Over the next 40 minutes or so, I'll speak to five main themes. What the Delamarian origin is and how did it form? How we were able to make use of new geophysical data, including magnetics, conductivity and density data to image the character of the Earth. I'll touch on the collaboration between Geoscience Australia, the MinEx CRC, and Geological Survey of New South Wales to test geophysical models through a stratigraphic drilling campaign. I'll speak to the new insights from a smaller sub-area of the Delamarian origin, the Loch Lily Cars Belt, and how our new interpretations cast light on an otherwise poorly understood area. But I'll also talk to the timing and nature of mineral systems across the Delamarian origin. And finally, I'll leave you with some conclusions. So let's kick things off. The Delamarian origin is shown here on the map in blue. It's the geographic extent of rocks that were deformed 
during a mountain building event 500 million years ago, million years ago called the Delamarian Orogeny. The Delamarian origin stretches over more than 2,000 kilometres roughly north-south and 300 kilometres wide, spanning parts of South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Through this talk, I'll be using terms like orogeny, origin and margin in their simplest forms. The term orogeny defines the tectonic compressional event resulting in mountain building. The origin is the geographical distribution of the, or, of the rocks deformed during the orogeny, so the rocks that have been made into a mountain. And the margin, mainly in this instance of the talk, is the easternmost edge of the Delamarian origin. The Delamarian origin marks the transition of pre-Cambrian Australia, shown in pink colours, to Phanerozoic Australia, also termed Tasmanites, shown in the green. The Delamarian origin separates the Proterozoic rocks that host world-class deposits like Olympic Dam and Broken Hill from the younger rocks of the Tasmanites also hosting world-class deposits for, for commodities like copper and gold, deposits like Bendigo, Cobar and Cadia. However, the Delamarian origin is buried beneath younger geological units and is less well understood than either the Proterozoic rocks or the Eastern Tasmanites. One of the questions we set ourselves was can new pre-competitive geoscience aid in discovery of Delamarian hosted deposits? Here is a zoomed in map of the regional Delamarian project area represented by the, the thick black bounding box. The background to this map is Geoscience Australia's total magnetic intensity grid of Australia. It shows the variations in the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field caused by the contrasting content of rock forming minerals in the crust. Broadly, uh, the, the brighter colours in this magnetic image can be equated to higher magnetic intensity. The reason I just speak about this is because I'll be showing this as a background for the majority of the maps throughout this talk. As mentioned on the previous slide, much of the Delamarian origin, represented by this, this dotted line here, is buried beneath the younger rocks um, like the Darling and Murray Basins. Where it does outcrop, the Delamarian origin that is, in, in areas such as the Coonanbury Belt or the southern end of the Grampian Zone, both shown here in red, the Delamarian origin is relatively well understood in that it has been well studied, proven to contain significant mineralisation as examples provided by the yellow, yellow beach balls, and has seen widespread ex mineral exploration. In contrast, the basement geology and mineral potential of the broad region between the Coonanbarri Belt and Grampian Stability Zone is less well understood and has seen significantly less exploration activity. And so we set ourselves our second question. What is between the exposed, relatively well understood and relatively well explored Coonanbarri Belt and Grampian Stability Zone? In addition, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to this, we also took a deep dive into the New South Wales side of the Lot Lily Cars Belt, shown here in blue. Here we sought to test what the differing mag magnetic characteristics of the belt were. We figured if we could demonstrate the presence of similar rocks to those in the north and south beneath cover, then these rocks could represent a significant exploration opportunity. I'll now take you through a geodynamic evolution of the Delamarian origin. To aid in this conceptualisation, I'll be making use of the approximate time slices of Earth um, from ancient Earth globe, just here. And just as a reminder, the very small red dot in each of these globes represents the modern location of Broken Hill. I'll also making, be making use of the amazing convergent margin cross settings of the Delamarian origin created by Sebastian Wong from Geoscience Australia. So between 850 and 520 million years ago, the eastern edge of the Australian continent was a passive margin. That is, it was not an active uh, a plate margin. This passive margin formed on the already existing continental crust of the Gawler Craton and Kernamona province, far, in this cross section farther to the west. During this part of Earth's history, we are seeing the breakup of the Rodinian supercontinent, where parts of the now North American continent separated 
from Australia. As this ocean formed, some of the oldest rocks of the Delamarian origin started to be deposited as fine-grained sands, muds, and carbonates. This slide shows a simplified time-space plot. The time component is on the left-hand y-axis, and the space component is represented by the modern-day states of South Australia, Victoria, and New South Wales. Paleoproterozoic, or pre-850 million year old geological units, are shown in pink at the bottom of this plot. These include the Gola Craton and Kona Mona provinces previously mentioned. As the 850 to 520 million year old passive margin evolved, deep marine, deep marine pelagic sediments, represented here in yellow, were deposited in parts of what is now South Australia and New South Wales. This was accompanied by magmatism associated with the Mount Arrowsmith volcanics in northern New South Wales, shown here in the dashed red, block, uh, red box. This was also accompanied by magmatism associated, uh, sorry, this was also accompanied by ultramafic to, uh, to mafic magmatism in Victoria, as shown by the blue box here. At around 520 million years ago, something happened that resulted in the initiation of westward dipping subduction. A subduction zone is where older, denser seafloor under thrusts a continental mass or even younger, more buoyant oceanic crust. This subduction zone led to the formation of a convergent margin. There are three main components to a convergent margin, or I'll use the term volcanic arc system or volcanic arc interchangeably throughout this talk. There's the back arc, the arc, and the fore arc, all of which have unique structural and geochemical signatures which enable us to understand where they are geographically in today's environment. But I'll touch on that briefly a little bit later. In this model, we show an oceanic crust with a possible oceanic crustal plateau. Whether or not it, ex whether or not it existed across the entirety of the Delamarian margin, um, we don't know, but it forms part of this model and I'll touch on it again in the next slide. So after its initiation at around 520 million years ago, subduction continued up to around 505 million years. Between around about 515 and 505 million years ago, the subduction zone started to roll back towards the east. What this did is it sort of put a pull on the arc system, resulting in extension in the back arc and local, uh, localised crustal thinning. The presence of the oceanic plateau is one of the ways in which slab rollback may have occurred along the margin of the Delamarian origin. What's happening is that that plateau is getting jammed up and forcing the, the subduction zone to roll back. But, as I said, we don't know if that was broadly across the entirety of the margin. And in fact, there are other mechanisms which can initiate slab rollback. In the back arc setting, shown here in the light blue boxes, marine sedimentary rocks were deposited. These were accompanied by tholidic magmatism, shown by these balloons with uh, crosses on them. As we move closer to the subduction zone, arc-related magmatism is shown here in red. Finally, on the eastern margin of the now Delamarian origin, turbididic sediments were deposited into a four-arc setting, shown here in green. In northern New South Wales, these turbidite sequences were also accompanied by more mafic magmatism. Moving forward, between 505 and 495 million years, the Delamarian orogeny occurred, which resulted in building of mountains. If you think about the modern day uh, Himalaya in Asia or Andes in South America, these may be examples of what this Delamarian mountain range may have looked like back 500 million years ago. It was at this time, things really did start to jam up in the subduction zone. At the end of the Delamarian orogeny, magmatism resulted in the emplacement of post-orogenic granitoids, mainly within South Australia, but out farther to the west of New South Wales, fluvial to shallow marine deposition occurred through the Mutawinji and Kairanara groups. By around 450 million years ago, the Delamarian orogeny had concluded and the subduction zone on the, on the western margin, uh, eastern margin of the Delamarian, had become extinct 
and moved farther out towards the east, creating a new arc system. But even in this arc system, we see some of the structures forming as we saw in the Delamirian, the back arc, the arc, and the fore arc. From 495 to 400 million years ago, there were other orogenic events occurring, including 490 to 445, the Nambran orogenic cycle, and the 435 to 385 million year old Tabarabran orogenic cycle, not represented here. These orogenic cycles are some of those later compressional events I mentioned at the start of this talk that may have had an influence on the geology and mineral systems of the Delamarian origin. Within the Delamarian origin, there was no major phases of crustal formation until the Silurian and Devonian, around 420 to 400 million years ago. This period of the Delamarian origin's history saw the depositional, deposition of marginal marine to fluvial Grampians group in Victoria and the Dorby formation in the Darling Basin of New South Wales. Sedimentary deposition was accompanied by Devonian age magmatism, more or less around 420 million years ago in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. These younger magmatic rocks correlate with the 435 to 385 million year old Tabarabran orogenic cycle farther to the east. And these, these, these magmatic rocks may, may have been emplaced by the exploitation of structural weaknesses within the Delamarian origin itself. The simplified time-space plot presented here, uh, presented here is built on the works of many previous researchers, but also includes neo-geochronological geochronological ages gathered by Geoscience Australia from both legacy and new drill cores. These are shown in dark, uh, in, in dark blue and light blue, respectively. It also includes um, new geochronological data from work undertaken by our partners in the Geological, so Geological Survey of South Australia, shown in yellow. These geochronological data were used to build, build on and test the current stratigraphic framework of the Delamarian origin. They help us further constrain the extent of the Delamarian arc rocks. They are designed to reduce the data gaps across the region, assess the continuity of the arc rocks across the origin, and also assess the extent of these 420 million year old magmatic rocks. So now we have a conceptual model of how the Delamarian origin formed. We, went, we, we wanted to then go and test this conceptual model by assess, assessing both existing geophysical data and undertaking new acquisition. I said that the Delamarian orogeny mountains, you know, during the Delamarian orogeny, mountains formed. These mountains still exist in South Australia as parts of the Flinders Ranges. However, much of the eastern portion of the, this mountain chain has been eroded and buried beneath cover. This is a landscape photo of the extent of how flat parts of outback New South Wales are today. And so we look through this cover to see what lies beneath. We employed the use of broadband magnetotelluric or MT data to image the electrical resistivity of structures to around 70 kilom uh, 60 kilometres depth. There's also, uh, th there's also opportunity to use long period magnetotellurics, but we didn't, to, to, to get greater depths, but we didn't use that as part of this study. We made use of deep crustal 2D reflection seismic data to investigate geological units that were buried. And we also made use of airborne electromagnetics, or AEM, to evaluate the landscape as well as assess shallow resistivity features to help us understand the depth of, uh, the depths of cover. Here's a map of the regional Delamarian project area showing the distribution of the acquired geophysical data collected as part of the Explorer for the Future program. As you can see, you know, it's pretty good coverage. We see um, the MT sites shown as the blue triangles where we extended the Kerner Mono cube uh, coverage from the University of Adelaide to incorporate parts of the Delamarian uh, origin rocks farther to the east. We acquired more than 1,200 kilometres of deep crustal reflection seismic data over the Delamarian origin, as shown in the purple lines, and made use of the AUSAEM airborne electromagnetics data 
and supplemented it with higher resolution infill. The white dots on this map represent the 17 drill holes drilled as part of this project, but I'll speak more to that in just a moment. The new resistivity models generated from magnetotelluric data show the relative conductive, in warmer colours, or resistive, cooler colours, of the crust, uh, features of the crust. We can interrogate these models in both X, Y and Z dimensions to slice through different parts of the Earth's crust. Here, we're presenting two depth slices through the Delamarian origin. On the left is the 40 kilometre depth slice, and on the right is the 10 kilometre depth slice. In the 40 kilometre depth slice, we see that the Kernamona province is conductive, but so is the East Nacra arc conductor, which does coincide with the main structural grain of the Delamarian origin, and is interpreted as ancient fluid pathways associated with major faults. On the shallower side, the 10 kilometre depth, we see what might be a conductive feature that broadly aligns with the north-south structural grains of the Delamarian margin. This might be an indication of linking of potentially the semiconductive features in the Kunanbri belt up here with that conductive feature at depth. However, the Murray Basin overlies this. And there may be more conductive waters within the aquifers of the Murray Basin that are masking the true conductive features at 10 kilometres. With the collection of new reflection seismic data, we've been able to interpret first order controls on the crustal architecture of the Delamarian origin. We've been able to image the distribution of geological units in the deep subsurface. And we've also been able to provide some estimates on the depth of cover. For this talk, we're going to be focusing on line 22G GACD2 in the red box, which images the central eastern Delamarian origin, where basement rocks are concealed beneath the Murray Basin. The image in the top right is an interpretation of where, the, where a volcanic arc or, or basement rocks have been faulted closer to surface. In this image, this green colour represents those basement rocks, and it's been correlated with some of the gravity work shown here in the warmer reds. We'll now zoom in to the image on the bottom, bottom right. <coughs> so what seismic data shows us is the contrast in rock densities. Here we can see the migrated, uninterpreted seismic data showing reasonably clear reflecti reflective features, particularly some of these semi-continuous uh, features in the northeast and even, even here in the southwest, which are characteristic of sedimentary basin, in, uh, basin field. We also see some more subtle continuous features that cross cut the seismic image from depth even all the way up to the surface. These features represent faults within the crust. Here we've mapped key faults and packages of reflectors of similar character. And then when we take that next step, we infill these packages with geology. Even over this relatively short line, we can see a diversity of geological features, including the Darling Basin, represented by the, these yellow, the mantle, shown up here in pink, and even the Mutawinji, Teltawonji and Ponto, Ponto groups, shown in the blues and orange. But of interest to this study is where we have interpreted relatively shallow depths of cover over Cambrian aged rocks here in green. This is located within the Lake Wintlow belt area. If these Cambrian aged arc rocks are the southern continuation of the prospective Coonanbury belt rocks, they may be of interest to explorers as they're only within a few hundred metres of cover. Finally, new airborne electromagnetic data allows us to better estimate the depth, uh, the depth to basement rocks across the Delamarian origin. Combining these data into a coherent model allows us to, to map the shallow cover and identify conductive or resistive, resistive features. Much like magnetotelluric data, the warmer colours shown here in AEM represents more conductive features, while the cooler colours represent the more resistive features. In this image on the right, we see the AEM curtains that penetrate up to a few hundred metres beneath the Earth's surface. What I've done is I've tried to outline the extent of the Delamarian origin here in orange and the Murray Basin here in pink. 
What we see is that there are definitely relatively shallow conductive features within the Murray Basin which represent the water contained within aquifers. One of the key, key, uh, key uses of using AEM as part of this study was help us to understand what is the depth to magnetic basin, basement because it was going to inform where we were going to drill. And so segueing into the National Drilling Initiative. So we now characterised and built our geophysical models of the region. Each type of geophysical technique has given us a glimpse into the varying levels of the Earth's crust. We're now ready to test these geophysical models with stratigraphic drilling. In the Delamarian origin, we typically, drill between, we typically drill between 150 and 700 metres before hitting crystalline basement rock. As well as drilling to collect samples of the earth, we also undertook borehole logging, collecting petrophysical data like natural gamma, conductivity and magnetic susceptibility. We took structural measurements of cores, oriented cores, to understand the deformation history of these rocks. And we took core and cutting samples to further undertake macro and micro analysis, geochronology, isotopic studies and geochemistry. To achieve our science objectives, we partnered with the Minex CRC and Geological Survey of New South Wales and undertook the National Drilling Initiative Delamarian Margins Drilling Campaign between February and July of 2023. This campaign made use of conventional drilling techniques and the newer coil tube drilling developed through DETCRC and continued through the Minex CRC. In this image, we see the typical coil tube drill pad. CT drilling typically offers faster, cheaper and safer drilling compared with more traditional drilling techniques. It also has around a quarter of the environmental put footprint um, as shown here, as it requires less, less support equipment at site. I'll now provide a brief video of some of the activities undertaken while drilling. Those in the room, you get music. Those online, you don't. But I'll speak over the top of it anyway. <laughs> Here we have um, the head driller just fitting um, the drill bit to, to the end assembly of, of the CT coil tube. The, the drill bit here ha is, is a, rotates, it also hammers, as you can see him just hammering it there. So it's similar to conventional drilling. But what's different is that the CT coil uh, string doesn't exist as three to six metre rods like conventional drilling. It's like a spooled fishing line. It's one continuous steel rod where an assembly gets attached that does the drilling down hole. What that means is we're not starting and stopping drilling every six, three to six metres. We can, we're able to continuously drill, which gives that faster rate of drilling. Because we're not ma uh, handling the rods and with manual labour, it also provides that safety component. The technology involved with the CT drilling, um, as shown here by the, the master control panel, is is leaps and bounds above some of the earlier model uh, types of conventional drilling. We can monitor the amount of fluids going in, how they're being processed, their densities, and all the way out to you know, how much material goes in the hole, out the hole, through the system, and back into the sumps. One of the core things that we do, we send our geos out. You know, here we have two, two of the team assessing some of the cuttings as they're coming out. This is critical because we need to know where we are in the stratigraphy when we're drilling. Are we looking at Murray Basin sediments or have we hit our crystalline basement? So, through the use of a combination of the conventional drilling and coil tube technology, 17 holes totaling more than five kilometres were drilled. The map on the right here shows the location of these drill holes. Green squares represent those drilled by coil tube and the blue diamonds represent those drilled by conventional methods. The primary aim of this drilling campaign was to understand and constrain the geology of the southern Loch Lee Cars Belt up here. But it was also used to assess whether the Cambrian magmatic rocks continued to the south of the Lake Wintlow Belt, which is through here, and this is that southern test. What we, were, what we were trying to understand is whether, again, you know, that, that narrative that I'm really emphasising in this talk, is there a continuation beneath cover of 
the Grampian Staveley zone in the south of Victoria, all the way up to the Coonanbarri Belt in the north. So in drilling, in drilling two of these holes here, um, we intersected igneous rocks like the Porphyritic Rye Day site on the left and the Granite Diorite on the right. The former uh, probably being placed at higher volcanic to subvolcanic levels, which potentially indicates that we intersected just the very top of a volcanic arc. Myself, having worked within the Staveley Belt in, southern, in, in Western Victoria several years ago, I can tell you right now, these rocks look amazingly similar to what we saw in, in those uh, earlier GA Staveley projects looking in, in Victoria. What's also quite interesting is that the ages that have come back from these rocks are around about 500 million years old. Again, similar to rocks of the Staveley Belt. And geochemically, these rocks look like the subduction-related arc rocks from the Grampian Staveley Zone. So it was looking more and more likely through geophysics, geochemistry, geochronology, and acquired through drilling, that we are getting more evidence for a continuous arc from the Coonanbarri Belt south to the Grampian Stavely Zone. The drill hole log presented here is an example of the wealth of information we've been able to glean from these 17 holes. In addition to traditional logs like uh, lithology and stratigraphy, we've combined spectral data from HighLogger to aid in our understanding of the variation within the, within the geology downhole. Not only this, but through the collaboration with MinEx CRC, we've employed the use of CSIRO's data mosaic software to, to take quantitative analyses like downhole geochemistry, geophysics, and spectral data to generate geological domains. This, uh, this domaining approach aids in the interpretation of both the broad scale uh, lithological changes, sort of shown on the, the right hand side of this column, to also through to the finer scale variations, not readily visible to the naked eye, shown here on the left hand side. So now we've got these new data available to us to, to begin our renewed interpretation of the Delamarian origin. We chose to focus on the area where we had the most data density. That's the Loch Lilly Cars Belt. So through the integration of the wealth of, of through the wealth of this new data acquired and, and through legacy information, we developed a new solid geology and stratigraphic framework for the Loch Lilly Cars Belt of the Delamarian origin. Previous to our work, much of the Loch Lilly Cars geology was equated with the undifferentiated, Ponto, uh, undifferentiated and Cambrian Age Ponto group from the Coonanbarri Belt farther to the north. Our work has built upon Geoscience Australia's recently released Layer Geology Map of Australia from, by Sanchez et al. and has identified 12 new stratigraphic units at both the group, formation and member level. That's all I'm going to say about this particular subject here today. Um, but if you'd like to know more about it, I'll direct you to the work by, uh, by Andrew Clark and others that was recently released. You may recall earlier slides which show the time-space plot of the Delamarian origin and the new geochronology data that we and others have collected over the region. New zircon uranium-led geochronology of samples collected through our drilling has revealed that in the Loch Lilly Cars Belt, there are resolvable magmatic events that give an indication on the timing of two pulses of magmatism, one at 510 million years ago and one at 500 million years ago. New geochronology data from the Loch Lui Cars Belt shows that much of the mafic and intermediate volcanic rocks are influenced by subduction related melts. This is good because remember our tectonic model was that we're in a subduction related convergent margin, so tick. When combining the geochemistry with the geochronology, of David Moll and, and I guess the geochemistry by Holly Taylor and others, we can start to see that between 510 million years ago and 500 million years ago, there was a spatial, temporal and chemical change in the geology. Here, we've interpreted a 500 million year old volcanic arc, like uh, rocks of 500 million year old, 510 million year old volcanic arc, where it transitions into, into a more back arc like setting at 500 million years. And then further afield and to the south, more arc-like, albeit that this is only constrained by one sample. So perhaps what we're seeing here is evidence for, for arc migration between 510 and 500 million years ago. 
and that slab rollback occurred at 500. So you form your arc at 510, arc migration at 500, slab rollback pulling it apart. But when we combine these new data interpretations in the lock willy cars belt with existing data and interpretations from others, we, uh, we, we go and propose the, a, a revised or, or newish tectonic model uh, where, broadly, where the broadly contiguous uh, volcanic arc system, shown here in red, correlated here in red, existed on the eastern margin of the Delamarian origin. We also suggest that there was a southern broadening of the back arc system, uh, part of the arc here in blue. So if we compare that broadening, um, we can look at two cross sections. The upper cross section here, shown in A, shows a relatively muted or, or small back arc extension. But when we compare that to the cross section here in the south, we're getting almost a hyperextension there. So it's not this, it's more this. So now we've set up the geological framework or, or scaffolding for mineral systems to form. In the coming slides, we'll see how our work through Yambo Chang has systematically characterised the mineral systems of the Delamarian origin in both space and time. We now know that the Delamarian origin is a convergent margin setting, and that convergent margin settings are known to host mineral systems. But what are these mineral systems and where are they? Not all treasure is silver and gold, mate, said Captain Jack Sparrow. Why I say that is because we're not looking for one or two mineral system types, that's uh, mineral, mineral types or metals. What I'll hope to convey to you in the next few slides is there's a whole range of elements within, the, within both the Loch Lee Cars Belt and Delamarian origin. Through the work of Yan Bo, we've been able to systematically characterise the timing and type of mineral systems across the Delamarian origin. Yan Bo has demonstrated the presence of five mineral system types. Epithermal, uh, porphyry epithermal I should say, volcanic hosted massive sulphide or VHMS. Magmatic or orthomagmatic nickel copper platinum group. Orogenic gold. And a fifth unspecified magmatic hydrothermal system. Not only have we been able to identify uh, the types of mineral systems across the Delamarian origin, but we've also identified five metallogenic events the time component. We'll now step back through time and build in the tectonic story or the geodynamic story from earlier in this talk to fill in this map on the right. To support the story, I bring back the convergent margin cross-section uh, cross diagrams created by Sebastian Wong and place the approximate location of where the mineral system may have formed in that environment. Starting back before the Delamarian orogeny at the passive margin setting around 590 to 580 million years ago, orthomagmatic nickel copper PGE or platinum group element mineralisation occurred within the mafic to ultra mafic Mount Arrowsmith area of the northern Coonanbarie Belt. This type of mineralisation is associated with basaltic rocks. Mineral mineralisation of sulphides in the pyro uh, like pyrite, shown here in the yellow, have been shown to be linked to commodities like copper, platinum group elements, but also cobalt and nickel. The distribution of these 590 to 580 million year old magmatic rocks is shown here in blue. And these rocks are largely constrained to the Coonanbury Belt. The 515 to 495 million year event saw the formation of three types of mineral system, porphyry epithermal, volcanic hosted massive sulphide or VHMS, and the unspecified magmatic hydrothermal event. This was during the stage of volcanic arc development just prior to the Delamarian orogeny. These mineral system types have the potential to host copper, gold and zinc, but also critical minerals like nickel, arsenic, gallium and germanium. Here we outline the extent of convergent margin rocks in green. But we also overlay what we've interpreted as the, the arc rocks, senso stricto, um, in yellow. The arc rocks can be prospective for a series of mineral systems that have a magmatic or hydrothermal origin. The formation of these Cambrian mineral systems is controlled by the evolution of the Delamarian arc in a continuous convergent margin setting. This means 
A series of geological processes can eventually lead to the formation of a spectrum of mineral systems, like I've mentioned, epither uh, porphyry epithermal, VHMS, and other types of magmatic hydrothermal systems. One example um, of a porphyry epithermal mineral system is the Glen Lyle deposit of the Grampian Staveley zone, shown down here in the south. But before I move on, I thought I'd uh, remind you that far field events can influence the geology and mineral systems within the Delamarian orogeny. I've shown what the pre pre Delamarian orogeny mineral system types are and their distribution. I'll now show what the post Delamarian orogeny mineral systems are. The 490 to 460 million year old granitic magmatism had a related porphyry, copper, molybdenum uh, mineralisation. And this was studied by the MINEX CRC through embedded researcher Dr Wei Hong in collaboration with the Geological Survey of South Australia and the University of Adelaide. Here we see an image of a granite sample with sulphide mineralisation shown by these glue, um, blue, these, these golden yellowy colours. And these minerals mainly consist of pyrite and chalcopyrite. Pyrite and chalcopyrite are good well, are good indicators of a copper system. These post delamarian orogeny ore deposits and their related granites likely formed due to those tectonic events farther to the east that may have resulted in, in this. So yeah, the granites that host these porphyries were generated by the tectonic events that were happening farther to the east. In this case, these systems developed on the far western edge of the Delamarian origin in South Australia, and that they were potentially exploiting the margin between the cold, hard, and old Gawler Craton and the softer, squishier, if you want to use that term, Delamarian origin. Commodities associated with these types of deposits are copper, molybdenum, and rhenium. As more tectonic cycles continued, orogenic gold systems were in place around the Tibiburra area of far northwestern New South Wales between 450 and 430 million years ago. A gold event is also identified farther south in Victoria within the, within the central stall zone. Systems of this age are associated with gold, arsenic, antimony and cobalt. The formation of orogenic gold systems is associated, uh, at least in the north, is associated with green schist to amphibolite fasces metamorphism of turbididic sequences and the activation or reactivation of regional scale fault systems during the Benambran orogeny around 490 to 445 million years ago. The last meta metallogenic event occurred in the Devonian about 420 to 400 million years ago, and consisted of a range of mineral systems, including porphyry epithermal and intrusion-related gold. Earlier in the talk, I mentioned how young magmatic rocks of around 420 million years old related, were related to the Tabarabran orogenic cycle farther to the east, may have been exploiting some of those structural weaknesses in the Delamarian origin. This is potentially a mineral system shown here that developed in association with that 420 year old magmatic event. We are seeing tectonic events more than a thousand kilometres away in today's landscape, driving mineralisation in what is now uh, western New South Wales and Victoria. These porphyry epithermal deposits are associated with a range of, critical, uh, of, of metals and critical minerals like copper, gold, zinc, silver, bismuth and tellurium. The map on the right here shows that distribution of Silurian Devonian age magmatic rocks along the eastern margin of the Delamarian origin. These rocks were formed about you know, 425 to 400 million years ago and have been found in New, uh, New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. In having characterised the type and timing of mineral system development, we were able to plot their distribution on this map. Here we show the magmatic events in the coloured polygons. The beach balls show the differing mineral system type. As you can see, there's a, quite a range of potential for a range, uh, for a range of systems um, that are in relative close proximity to one another. And that these systems host a range of commodities, including critical minerals and strategic materials. However, these identified mineral systems are either at surface 
or really quite shallow. There remains a large part of the Delamarian origin that has no known mineral systems present. And I wonder, what opportunity awaits those who are willing to dive beneath the cover of the Murray Basin? And so we come towards the end of the Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture. At the start of this talk, there were two questions posed. What is between the exposed, relatively well-studied and well-explored Coonanbury Belt and Grampian Stavely Zone? And can new pre-competitive geoscience aid in the discovery of Delamarian host deposits? <coughs> I only present a couple of the conclusions from this study here today, but I hope they go some way to answering those questions. We've provided evidence, we think, of a contiguous belt of Cambrian arc volcanic rocks beneath the Murray Basin, linking the Coonanbury Belt in the north to the Grampian Stavely Zone in the south. The geology of this Cambrian aged arc system is consistent, but we do note that there is some variation from the north to the south due to the broadening of that back arc as, we, um, as, as you go south. We've identified that there are five metallogenic events across the Delamarian origin, and these events are associated with critical minerals and strategic materials. These identified mineral systems are linked to the geodynamics of the region, that is, They've been influenced and driven by regional tectonics through time. And so back to these questions. What is between the Coonanbury Belt and Grampian Stavely Zone? Well, beneath the Murray Cover, we think there are rocks of similar nature that may also be prospective. Can you pre-competitive geoscience aid in discovery of Delamarian hosted deposits? Short answer, yeah, sure can. If we're brave enough to take that next step and look where others haven't. I'd like to thank our partners and collaborators, without whose support this project would not have been as successful as it was. And I should note, not every partner or collaborator was able to be included on this slide. So if, you're missed out, if you've missed out, my sincere apologies. How'd you go? <laughs> Who got bingo? Did you find the Farmers Union nice coffee? Yeah, I was in the video, yeah. What about the stereo net? Yeah. The phone, it was a sneaky one, it was straight after I set the challenge. And the pirate quote, oh, that, was a, that was a gimme, yeah. <laughs> Captain Jack Sparrow. Look, in, in closing, I, I really want to acknowledge and thank the traditional owners of country where these works were undertaken and the support provided by both individuals and community to access that country. Uh, collectively, we, we do thank the landholders and land managers with who, this, with who we negotiated to get on, on land for the drilling. And again, thanks to our colleagues here at Geoscience Australia for nominating this talk and this study to the Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series for 2024.